Um, I'm just going to say a few brief words. Um, some of you might know I was uh, briefly an environment minister uh, and I was chairman of the all-party environment group. I found our climate, the tragic decline of species, something that has been absolutely absorbing for me uh, as a parliamentarian uh, for a great many years. But I also was in the military. Uh, I was on the Defence Select Committee and I was latterly in my House of Commons career in the, um, on the Intelligence and Security Committee. So I feel that in this subject, two, uh, two worlds are colliding. Uh, and I, it's absolutely uh, front and centre of what SEN should be about. Uh, SEN is now the fastest growing caucus in Westminster. It's uh, the place to be if you're on the centre right. And uh, it is uh, really important that it looks at the security implications of climate change. Um, I think it was the, the Pentagon that uh, was the first to use the words risk escalator in terms of, uh, uh, of climate change. And uh, the World Bank said that by 2050, 143 million people are likely to be displaced. By 2050, will be displaced by uh, the, the impact of climate change. Uh, so tonight, um, we brought together uh, some decision makers, some uh, representatives, some thinkers, uh, all of whom have got a great story to tell. And uh, I want to go straight over to them. I'm going to go first to, 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 to the minister. And I'll come back and introduce him in a minute. Then I'm going to Tom Tugendhat, who, as you know, is the chair of the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, and then we're going to Erin Sikorsky, who's the director of the Washington-based International Military Council on Climate and Security, which is exactly what uh, we're talking about today. This is a, a Washington-based institute, institute which um, operates over 38 different countries uh, and uh, in this very key nexus of climate and security. James Rogers, who I hope is joining us, I can't see him yet with us, is, is from this new organization in Westminster. The, he's a co-founder of the Council on Geostrategy, um, uh, which is dedicated to making the UK and other uh, free and open countries stronger, greener, and more prosperous. Amen to that. Uh, and uh, so we welcome him. And uh, Sophia Gaston, who is the director of the British Foreign Policy Group, an independent, non-partisan, London-based um, uh, think tank, which seeks to strengthen the UK, the UK's international engagement. Um, I hope I haven't missed anyone out. Uh, with that, I will, will give each speaker uh, five minutes to, to, to talk. I know that our minister has to go, and I know Tom is also pressed, and maybe others. So we want to wrap this up at close to within an hour, and I want to give as many people the chance to questions. But James uh, came into Parliament and uh, with a very uh, strong uh, military background, having uh, fought in most of what, what Tom referred to as Blair's Wars, and um, then uh, immediately embraced the environmentalism and uh, the, the, the importance of tackling climate change uh, uh, in a really educated and thoughtful way and has been a, a huge asset to SEN. And we now find him it, it, as Minister for the Armed Forces, um, perfectly placed to discuss this uh, and related issues. James, thank you for giving us your time. Uh, over to you. Thanks, Richard. Um, and hello, everybody. It's nice to be back uh, with SEN. Uh, I was told when I was promoted to government, which was an otherwise wonderful experience, um, that it had to also bring with it my removal from the SEN Parliamentary Caucus. Uh, and instead, I was made a SEN alumni. Uh, but I'm very proud to be, be one of those. And I suspect it's only a matter of time before I'm allowed to uh, rejoin the SEN Parliamentary Backbench Caucus. But um, We'll, we'll see. Um, I thought yesterday was a, a great moment for those of us who uh, have been talking about uh, climate change as a geostrategic threat, because the integrated review put front and centre uh, that climate change is exactly that, and therefore it should be a priority of our foreign policy to lead in decarbonisation and efforts to persuade the world to uh, to embrace the challenge of arresting climate change. Um, and those are levers broadly held by others. I, I'm, I'm not sure that we're yet in the place where we're 
sending ships to uh, to to stop people from burning hydrocarbons. But um, but the fact is that in the meantime, for the MOD, there are an awful lot of threats that emerge as a consequence of climate change, and those are. And, and you know, we've been very clear as we've been going through our integrated review process that we should not see climate change simply as an aggravator of existing threats. Climate change in itself is a threat and that gears you towards how you structure the force, how you envisage future operations. Um, now, some people might argue that there is a silver lining to all of this within the security space at least, um, that there is um, a lot of the conflicts of the last century have been motivated by competition over access to hydrocarbons. So if we're going to be in a world where oil and gas is less important, then one might think that that is one of the key drivers for, uh, for, for conflict removed. And, and fingers crossed that that may be the case. But we should also recognize that um, there will be other scarce resources essential to clean tech that will be just as keenly competed on over one might imagine in the future. So I am not uh, overly hopeful that the removal of oil and gas as a motivator for conflict will mean that there's no longer any conflict over, over critical scarce resources. You know, we're just changing what the strategic resources now are. Um, Further, uh, I think there are three obvious areas of threat that arise as a consequence. The first is, uh, and, I, and I, I, I wouldn't want anybody watching this to think that somehow I was uh, uh, an enthusiast or even that I accepted the opening up of the melting of Arctic ice, uh, but my job is to work out what we need to do to keep the United Kingdom safe. And it is a sad reality that a consequence of climate change is that the high north becomes a potential point of competition and conflict as a northern sea route opens between the Pacific and the Atlantic. And that brings with it a big so what for us in terms of what we ask of from the Royal Navy, uh, how we keep an eye on that part of the world uh, and how we maintain the international laws of the sea in that sea route so that it is uh, somewhere where free passage can be enjoyed by all nations, not just those that happen to have a coastline on that route as it opens up. And as I say, I know there'll be some who are affronted by what appears to be uh, us condoning uh, uh, that, that the opening up of that route, but it is a simple reality and the UK interest requires us to guard against the threat that it brings. Secondly, desertification. Uh, I was in the Sahel last week uh, in Mali, uh, and then I was down in Ghana and uh, across in Gambia. Uh, and it is clear that climate change is an aggravator in a part of the world where weak government uh, means that life is hard and the warm embrace of violent extremist organizations uh, is therefore uh, the, art, the only answer for a lot of people when it comes to how they, how they make a living. Uh, and as desertification gathers pace and people are pushed further south out of the Sahel um, for the sake of their own survival, one can see that as an aggravator for um, further instability and insecurity in literal West Africa. Uh, and that won't be, you know, the Sahel won't be the only uh, sub-desert, currently habitable region of the world where desertification will drive people to move and therefore cause uh, instability and insecurity. Uh, and that is already somewhere, you know, in the Sahel, in the Lake Chad Basin, uh, over in uh, Somalia and Sudan, you already see along those whole lines of long latitude uh, that, uh, that the, um, that, that, that that is happening and it's a key cause for concern. Finally, uh, competition over scarce resources. Just the, the simple challenge of having access to clean water and uh, to food. We see that with the 
disputes between Egypt, Ethiopia, Sudan over uh, who can and can't build dams on the Nile and what that means for water supply into enormously populous countries. Uh, and there will be plenty of other examples beyond, but these are the realities of what will drive conflict over the next 50 years. The IR gets after that within the Ministry of Defense, we're aware of it. Um, there are some so what's around how we design stuff that is so super secret that it's not for Zoom, especially as Zoom is owned by China. Uh, I'm amazed Tom Tugendhat's even willing to appear on Zoom. Uh, but uh, but there we go. Uh, and um, uh, But there are some realities to how we structure the force and how we invest in platforms so that we are able to successfully operate in the high north. And increasingly, we're able to successfully operate in sub-Saharan Africa, where I think so many of the themes of the IR play out in terms of competition between uh, our adversaries, the realities of those factors I've listed as drivers for conflict, and the UK's role as a force for good in the world in trying to do something about that. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, uh, James. That, that was fantastic uh, opener for us. And also congratulations for keeping to time, which I know all the other speakers will as well. And I'm really delighted you're hanging on to answer a few questions. And so I say to people, if you can start putting your questions in the chat room or, or uh, just put your hand up and we will uh, try and get to you. Uh, Tom Tugendhat, like James, has a military background. He's, uh, as I say, chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee uh, currently doing an inquiry into this very area of work uh, and has his own uh, clear views on this as well, which I've discussed with him many times. Tom, over to you. Thanks, Richard. Look, it's a huge pleasure to be with you, and I am delighted that I am uh, James's warm-up act for his questions session. So don't listen to me. Think of questions for James, and we'll all get through this rather less painfully. Um, this is a hugely important subject for us on the Foreign Affairs Committee, not just because we've got COP at the end of the year and not just because of the huge issues that it uh, raises for so much of Britain's foreign policy in terms of cooperation with others, all the way from China, uh, James knows my favourite regime, and uh, all the way through to South America, where we did an inquiry last, sorry, not last year, 2019. <laughs> last year seems to have uh, been a, 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 a zero. But it's because of the fundamental questions it asks us about how we achieve a peaceful, prosperous, uh, continued existence, frankly, of not just the British people, but of every people. And that's where we've been looking at various different aspects of uh, the different laydowns of Britain's diplomatic embassies uh, around the world to see how we're achieving our aim. And I have to say we have a mixed result because it's certainly true that Britain puts a huge amount of emphasis onto biodiversity, uh, onto climate change, and onto uh, the various different partnerships that make it possible. But there is, of course, so much more we can do. This meeting in Glasgow in November is going to be one of the really uh, telling moments for British diplomacy. And forgive me, James, but my job is not to support the government, but to criticize it and to encourage it to do better. And here, I hope, uh, that there is some folk listening. Because what we're seeing at the moment is we're seeing only the beginning of what really needs to be a massively increased effort. Britain is not just chairing the event, Britain is shaping the event alongside our Italian partners, who are of course absolutely fundamental to the process. We need to be driving ideas and driving options. Now, What's interesting about the integrated review that came out yesterday is that there are many, many different ways in which we could do that. And certainly would be unfair to say the government is bereft of ideas. On the contrary, it has many, but we need to see them put into practice. Now, whether this is uh, offset carbon offset trading or whether it's uh, different forms of making sure that we don't just offshore our dependency uh, while we uh, force the dirty aspects of uh, global trade onto others. There is a huge amount we need to look at for ourselves. Too much of our uh, structure at the moment as a country has been about keeping ourselves green and clean while making the dirty decisions fall on others' shoulders. Now, I think there's a huge opportunity for the UK to transform not just uh, ourselves, but actually an entire global economy here. Because the reality is, if you talk to 
Americans or Italians, who are very obviously very important for the COP process at the end of the year, but also to folk in India and Indonesia and Japan, as I've had the great good fortune to on this wonderful Zoom platform uh, in the last year, we are seeing a very, very big change in the way that we deal with climate change and the way that we as global citizens understand it. So I see the, the integrated review as really a, an important step, but very far from a final one. And I see COP uh, not just as an event, uh, but a process. So what are the challenges for us? Well, the challenges for us are fundamentally the same as they've always been. Think hard, connect to others, and make sure that we have a proper coherent strategy for bringing others together, for transforming the way that we engage with the world, and making sure that the effects of climate change, which James so rightly highlighted, whether they be migration from the Sahel, or whether they be the threats that could come from the uh, melting sea ice in the north, we need to be ready and structured to deal with them just as much as we need to be ready and structured to make sure that two degrees is a maximum and not just a waypoint. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. That's fantastic. Um, so I'm going to rat rattle on because I really want to get through these uh, initial comments and we can get on to questions. Erin, I've already said, is, for, is the director of the Washington-based International Military Council on Climate and Security. Uh, it's lunchtime for her. Uh, really kind of you to come and join us. Erin, over to you. Happy to be here. Thanks, Richard. And thanks for allowing an American in your midst today. Uh, what I thought I would do is three things in my opening remarks. One, touch on the Biden administration's strategy uh, on climate security. Two, what that means for the US military. And then three, what that means for uh, international relations and geopolitics from an American perspective. Um, but I'll, I'll keep this brief. I mean, I'm sure you're all well aware that it's a 180 degree change here with the uh, Biden administration on climate change compared to where we were pre-January 20th. We're really in an all hands on deck moment and he's following through on the campaign promise to put, as you all have said, climate change front and center in foreign and security policy. And we see this not only in the focus on decarbonization, obviously with John Kerry leading that charge, but also in a couple other areas that I think are really important for security. One is a better uh, understanding and analysis of the threats posed by climate change. And we saw that in the executive order that came out in late January, where he required that the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence, uh, do a national intelligence estimate on climate security, and that the Pentagon do a climate risk analysis of um, climate security. Both of these, I think, are critical for understanding how climate's going to shape the national security landscape and some of the challenges that James and, and Tom talked about in the Arctic, but elsewhere. Uh, as well. The other piece that I think was really important is the integration that we're seeing of climate security across foreign policy. It's not just the responsibility of the climate change experts, it's the responsibility of everyone in the national security apparatus. So within 90 days of the uh, start of the executive order, every agency has to show how climate change will play into its regional strategy, its country strategy. Um, and this is, this is a change from even what we saw in the Obama administration, and it's a real push. Um, what does this mean for the US military? I see it as a step change really in their approach. I think as Richard mentioned in the beginning, you know, the Pentagon has recognized the threat by clim of climate change for decades. And it is one of the few places within the Trump uh, uh, time that climate action continued. But most of that focus has really been on uh, things related to resilience, uh, bases, US military bases, evaluating the climate threat there, infrastructure, force readiness, all of which is, is really important. Uh, but now that the administration's hitting the gas and pushing uh, it to be integrated into our broader strategy, that's, that's a whole new ball game, I think, in, in some ways for the US Pentagon. And they're really gonna have to race to catch up. Um, I had a piece written in War on the Rocks that was released last week that looked at this. Unfortunately, the bench in the Pentagon and in the national security community in the US is pretty thin when it comes to climate uh, expertise. I also think it just doesn't, it, it, it comes up against other uh, competing uh, priorities like China, for example, and it's gonna require a, a strong steer 
from Secretary Austin and others going forward to make sure that that, that longer term broader focus holds for the military going forward. Uh, and they don't just revert to looking just at, at readiness and, and the bases and, and things along those lines. And again, that's all very important, but it's not enough, I think, as the other speakers have outlined. Which brings me to my third point, which is what does this mean for US grand strategy, international relations, geopolitics? And here again, looking at China, I think too often what you're seeing in the discourse now is that China and climate are set up in opposition. Either you're a climate hawk or you're a China hawk and we can't figure out a way to cross uh, the path. And clearly, I mean, foreign policy is about trade-offs and I don't wanna paint a picture that we can have our cake and eat it too, but I think the framing is a little bit too stark and some of the wrong questions are being asked. I don't think the question is, is climate change a bigger threat than China or a bigger risk than China? But instead, how does climate change shape the competition with China, the competition with Russia? How does climate change shape Chinese behavior on the world stage? What is driving um, their decisions around BRI or, um, of the action in the South China Sea or in Sub-Saharan Africa or Latin America, we need to understand those questions and ask those questions in the analytic work that um, is being done in support of the executive order. And I hope that that's going to shape some of the conversation because what keeps me up at night when I think about these threats are places like South Asia, right? Where scientific projections show that climate change is going to change the disposition and flow of the Asian water tower that's anchored in the Tibetan plateau got 10 of Asia's major rivers that originate there, including the Indus and Brahmaputra. Of course, at the same time, you have India and China locked in intense geopolitical rivalry. There's no trust there and no sharing of information. When you layer these climate risks on top of that, what does that mean for conflict risk in the region between two nuclear powers? These are the kind of questions we have to ask about climate change when we think about it shaping the national security landscape. And I think there's a lot of room for partnership uh, between the US and its allies and partners around the world looking at these issues and how to, how to take them on head on. And again, I think the Biden administration is really revving things up. Um, and I just, the national security agencies here are gonna have to work hard to keep up and make sure that again, as I think Tom said, these aren't just first steps or they, they aren't just the only steps in one-time events, but they're just the first steps in moving these issues forward and integrating them for the long-term. Erin, thank you very much. And I might just flag up to our two politicians that when we finish the initial comments, we might come back to that point uh, to see whether we think that the UK government and institutions are really factored in, really networked into the what the Biden administration is doing on this front. It's it's just a, it's such a key moment for us all. Um, James, before you joined us, I had sort of given you a, a slight introduction because. You are um, a co-founder of the new kid on the block in the uh, think tank world, and um, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, can we have your five minutes and uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the organization you run in, in 10 seconds, and then get on to the subject after that? Thank you, and thank you very much for inviting me to uh, speak. So we've just founded a new uh, think tank called the uh, Council on Geostrategy, and we're trying to look into three key issues. Firstly, how to strengthen Britain in the 21st century. Uh, the second issue being um, how we can compete geopolitically with um, peers and near peers. And finally, another issue which is often overlooked, but is connected to that and which we're talking about today, that is the role of the environment in this kind of um, situation or in, in the 21st century um, as well. So we're trying to straddle across those three different issue areas and um, to help add a little understanding to what's already available um, out there. So that's my very brief introduction and if I move quickly into my um, my brief presentation. So I, I, re I reviewed the integrated review last night and I think it begins to appraise or reappraise many of the dominant assumptions that we've been um, thinking since the end of the Cold War and I think that's uh, long, long overdue. So I'm very pleased to see that the integrated review also places an even heavier emphasis on the challenge of climate change and also in enhancing scientific innovation to develop the technologies that are required to overcome the problem. And I think this also connects very well with Britain's position in the world, because innovation is where Britain has historically been very, very strong. Uh, Britain has never been a great power in the traditional sense. 
It has never been particularly large, but it's always been extremely uh, creative. British scientists, innovators, and engineers pioneered the Industrial Revolution, of course, which provided us with the means, the technological means, to fundamental change the world around us, I think largely for um, the better. Uh, ultimately, the only way, however, we will overcome the climate crisis is through sustained technological innovation in developing cleaner um, and greener and more abundant uh, energy technologies, such as fusion power. Wind turbines and solar panels may be nice, but they are not enough, I think, to take us to the next level of development or even to sustain industrialization in other parts of the world. And we've been given a taste of that over the last 10 to 15 years um, with China's uh, emerges, emergence as an increasingly wealthy and powerful state. Uh, the world needs more energy um, and we need it soon, particularly with the emergence of Africa soon in the later part of the century as potentially the world's most populous continent. Consequently, I would like to see free and open countries grouped together to provide the resources, and the resources will be large, to develop the groundbreaking technologies of tomorrow. In a sense, we need a modern Manhattan project or a modern Apollo program, not to develop nuclear weapons or space rockets, but to develop the high risk but high reward technology that will ensure we keep climate change from developing into a full blown crisis. However, there is one area in the integrated review where I think more work is needed. And that's because it fails to join some of the dots. And I think that's already been mentioned by some of the other panelists. This is because in a way it lets China off the hook and in so doing it also lets us off the hook. China's emergence as an economic and geopolitical force in the world, led by a government with very different values and ethics to our own, um, is intrinsically tied with the deindustrialization of countries like ours. We buy vast amounts of materials and products made in China at great cost to the environment. Chinese factories operate under environmental legislation far less stringent than our own. We then ship these goods all the way around the world at additional cost to the environment until they reach us. I think therefore we have to begin breaking this cycle because the two greatest challenges of our age a China that is a systemic competitor, as the Integrated Review calls it, um, and uh, the growing uh, climate crisis um, are intrinsically interwoven. Ultimately, we need to reassess our globalized economic model if we're going to push back against China's revisionism and protect the environment. That requires new thinking, and the Integrated Review provides some of that, but I think it's only the start, and we need to modify it further still. Thank you. Thank you, James. That's really helpful. I see. I can see some comments coming in on the chat room and uh, the Q and A. Please keep them coming. Uh, I've got some others here, so uh, we won't be short of them. But I, I want to get as many of you in as possible. Uh, and so we move on to our last, but certainly not our least important speaker, uh, Sophia Gaston, the director of the British Foreign, Foreign Policy Group. Uh, really good of you to be with us. Um, over to you. Hi, um, thanks very much for having me. And just to say my name is pronounced Sophia. Um, I'm so sorry. You didn't no, <laughs> not at all. It's, 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 a, it's an English thing. Um, so uh, I am the director of a think tank called the British Foreign Policy Group. And we're rather unusual in that we focus on the intersection of the domestic and the international. My background is as a social researcher. And so we do a lot of work on public opinion about foreign policy, which was a very underexplored area. Um, and I've been very delighted to be involved in the integrated review and looking about at how you can build public consent uh, for an ambitious foreign policy agenda. Um, I was asked to speak a little bit about public opinion on some of the issues that we're talking about today. Uh, we recently published a big annual survey, uh, which incorporated quite a lot about climate change. First thing is that climate change really is seen as a security risk. Um, at the same to the same degree as we actually regard a lot of the more traditional security risks now so 78% of Brits regard climate change as a security risk and of that half of the British population regard it as a critical threat so I think in many ways the argument about framing um, climate change as an existential risk has um, has been one um, 
we also looked at attitudes to the UK's leadership on climate change, and these are pretty positive overall. So 68% of Brits support the UK's leadership of climate change. Um, there is quite a significant degree of variation between different social and political groups. Um, and because we're uh, speaking at the Sen today, I should say that conservative voters are on the whole less enthusiastic about action on climate change than um, voters for other parties, well, certainly the major other parties. Um, that is primarily driven by conservative leave voters who who are distinct in their antipathy towards uh, climate change action i should just reinforce though that is relative to other parts of the population so that's why you still get that very solid figure overall um looking at who does and who doesn't support the uk's leadership on climate change action on a, on a social and demographic level there's some quite interesting stories to tell and particularly the deconstruction of this mythology of this sort of very urbane young climate activism uh project it's actually older brits and brits who live in towns and rural areas who are much more enthusiastic about action on climate change and there is a really significant gender dimension to this. And uh, there's been a little bit of further digging to understand uh, the rationale behind that and um, the formation of, of public opinion and women on this. And it seems this very much pertains to um, women sort of a, a higher degree of conscientiousness towards future projected risks, particularly those which may cause social harm. Um, and there is a much stronger kind of community minded um, uh, sort of spectrum around uh, the formation of women's public opinion on this issue. But overall, look, the story is good across the board. And I think this really does demonstrate the power of political influence and particularly the consistency of messaging. This is one issue that the Conservative government has you know, been continuing to champion uh, throughout the past decade. Um, and you're starting to see uh, the effects of that uh, really playing off. And that consistency of messaging is something that we see again, and again, and again. Um, if you're talking about foreign aid, for example, the issues that people feel uh, they support most instinctively because they regard them as the sort of bread and butter of our um, aid and development spending. Um, those are actually the issues that have just received the greatest consistent degree of political support, media support, and even celebrity support. So there's a huge shaping influence um, at play here. Um, I do think that part of the success in this area has been down to the positioning of climate action as making good business sense and um, something I've, I've been doing quite a lot of work on how you uh, merge and fuse uh, the global Britain and leveling up agendas. And I think adding this third strand of climate action to that makes really good sense. Um, and I think, you know, in, both in terms of uh, delivering for the British people, but also building public consent. Um, and I think, you know, that there is an urgency around this because the reality is that the next decade is where things are going to get a lot trickier. We're moving from climate change being abstract, both in its impacts, um, but also in terms of the changes that we're going to have to start making on an individual level. A lot of the shifts in our society thus far have been um, driven by consumers um, or driven by business and industry. We're going to get to the point where we're looking at legislation and so on, and, and that's going to be a very different conversation politically. Um, and you start to see some of the rockiness ahead um, when we start to look at individual willingness to take action on climate change. So we've asked about a, a really diverse range of different commitments um you know whether it's taking more public transport um or reducing plastic or changing the way you eat and 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 interact with um food and consumer goods um and as soon as we get to this we see two things first again that consistency of messaging we can see the attenborough effect action on plastic is is the most singularly supported um, area, uh, followed by reducing food waste, which is something that's been championed by the supermarket. So again, the power of that consistent messaging, when you start to get beneath that, uh, you're really tapping into social inequalities. And that becomes quite stark, the differences between different social groups and their willingness and I think we should also think about that in their capacity to be taking individual action on climate change. So 
I think that does uh, suggest uh, just how significant uh, the kind of next roadmap is going to have to look at, you know, shifting climate change from just a kind of foreign policy and security issue um, to really thinking about its impact domestically on bread and butter politics. Um, and just finally, um, we've talked, uh, we've mentioned China and Russia and so on. Um, and uh, I was asked to, to, to look at whether there might be some interesting collaborating with these nations on climate change. There's absolutely no interest in, in collaborating with Russia on anything. Um, and I think that the integrated review makes quite clear that, that uh, the British government will be, uh, you know, not regarding China as uh, Russia as a kind of credible actor. The story on China is quite different. About 38% of Brits support um, engaging and collaborating with China on climate action. Um, but the very interesting story about engagement with China from a political perspective is that the balanced approach that the government is pursuing is least popular amongst conservative voters. So the biggest support for this combination of challenging on human rights, collaborating on climate change, having some kind of higher education engagement, and even some kind of economic engagement that's mainly supported by non-conservative voters. So I think there's quite a, a long road ahead for the government in, in, in persuading the British public of making that case uh, for, for any kind of positive degree of engagement with China, because as we've seen, um, there's been a very significant hardening of public opinion towards China uh, in a very short space of time. So I've covered quite a lot of ground there, but I'll leave it there for now. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. And I sense from the SEN team that they will want you back to talk about this, uh, particularly the, the, the political side of it and the, the, the people's views. Can I bundle two questions, first of all, to the two politicians? Um, uh, and that is, uh, how can the UK and US armed forces respond to a warmer world. And I might extend that for Tom to say, our overseas um, diplomatic service and, uh, and the agencies that uh, support it. You know, are, they, are, they, are we really factoring in um, this change? And I'm going to lump this together with a challenge that Erin uh, produced, which is when we heard the screeching of tires on the 21st of January, uh, as the US system, machinery of government changed direction by 180 degrees. Do we get it? I, I mean, we're, we're talking to Secretary uh, uh, Blinken and, um, uh, and Kerry, and we are, please tell us, absolutely hand in glove with this agenda. I think that's what we'd really like to know. So James, can I start with you? You're muted. <clears throat> Thanks, Richard. Uh, I mean, you know, the answer to your question is yes, this is, uh, this is driving us in lots of ways. I set out in my introductory remarks how it drives our planning around the operational commitments we think we might have in the next few decades. Um, but there's also a reality about the MOD as one of the UK's top emitters needing to be um, you know, needing to hit net zero ourselves. Uh, the RAF is an enthusiastic participant in Jet Zero, which is the DFT initiative for um, decarbonizing aviation. Uh, and actually, you know, I think there's sort of lots of um, lots of advantage there, where we think if we can we can help develop a, a, a much more sort of carbon or less carbon intensive fast jet fuel for for fighters then that will have enormous utility in the commercial sector. So we're doing that. We are the second, land, second largest landowner in the UK, which gives us lots of opportunity to do stuff uh, in terms of how we manage our land for uh, the advantage of the environment more generally, but participate in carbon markets potentially. Um, we recognize that uh, there's a moral authority that, or that there's a sort of moral high ground that comes with operating in countries that are affected by climate change with tanks, vehicles, whatever, that are that are as green as possible and that actually sort of going into countries that are affected by climate change with vehicles that are spewing out huge amounts of, 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 of crap from the exhaust is, is, um, is not great. So it, it shapes us on two levels. Does the operational, your question was, are we preparing for the consequences of climate change? Yes both in the sort of polar regions where competition there becomes more present, but also 
in the parts of in the rest of the world where the effects of climate change will be the most acute and then also in terms of the way that we operate because that feels like the responsible thing to do i mean i note some of the stuff that's been said about you know why can't we all just put competition aside and and get on together and address this i'd love to i'd love to but um i think in a building like this you're rather obliged to consider the possibility that some countries and some actors around the world might still want to compete a bit and therefore we need to be ready to do our bit should that moment of competition comes thank you tom uh, thanks richard um I have to say, I, th I thought Erin's uh, points were extremely provocative and um, very welcome. And I, I thought that her 180 degrees uh, description was an extremely welcome one as, as well, frankly. Um, it's certainly something that I've noticed uh, with the engagement I've had with the new US administration, and I'm sure the government has too. <coughs> Excuse me. I think the reality is that we are now very well aligned. Uh, on uh, environmental policy with our US friends. And actually, we are very closely aligned with many others as well. The challenge, and, 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 and Sophie, um, Sophie nailed this as well, was on China. Because the, the reality is that when we talk about engagement with China, it's difficult to be sure that we're talking about the same thing, in the sense that China's dominance of the environmental industries, by which I mean everything from solar panels to you know wind turbines, uh, has really been much more about taking a lead in a market than it has been about changing uh, environmental direction. And though we've seen certainly responses to local pollution, we haven't seen the same commitment to global climate change. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a marked difference. Now, I still very much hope that the fact that China's imports of rice uh, under threat from the salinization of the uh, paddy fields of the eastern seaboard uh, and indeed uh, the extremely well put point by Erin about the competition for water resources in the high plateaus of the Tibetan uh, region are absolutely clear so I hope that you know this position will change but I it's certainly not something that we're seeing changing just yet and Chairman Xi has shown no great indication for it uh, while he has shown a great determination for other areas. So um, let's see. But I have to say, on the diplomatic engagement with our, 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 if you like, democratic partners, our free world partners, we're seeing a much greater level of coherence. That is very welcome. Uh, any of the other speakers want to come in on this point? Uh, you OK, or shall I go on to the next question? Um, I, I, there's a question from Audley Burnett. Uh, do the panel, panelists consider the theme of competition, which has been flagged by us, or is it appropriate? It, James just touched on this. Um, you, you know, I think a lot of younger people, particularly, um, sort of echo the, the feeling of Greta Thunberg and others that um, you know, global leaders position themselves. And we'll see this in Glasgow, won't we? We will see uh, people holding out for more and you know, look, it will, it will seem that the whole thing is going to collapse because of the actions of one or two countries and people want to blame the chair or whoever it is. But, you know, there still, it still is a competitive world and we have to live in the real politic. What do you think of the chances of success in terms of uh, how this can affect particularly vulnerable nations? Uh, Erin, is there anything that you'd like to come in on this? Sure, I guess I would, I would say a few things on the theme of competition. One is competition isn't necessarily in and of itself a terrible thing when it comes to climate change. There can be a race to the top, right, to, to do better and to be leaders on the issue on the world stage. And if um, China wants to lead in a way that actually reduces carbon emissions, I, I think that that could be a positive step. But you need to have your eyes wide open about um, uh, the relationship there. And there are lots of different pieces of the relationship. I do think it's really interesting to see the debate currently going on within China right now, actually quite publicly about coal. There's a big article in the New York Times about this yesterday and you know, putting my former intelligence analyst hat on. I wanna think about how do we use that to our advantage to get change on, on climate and address security risks. And so you need to understand, I think as Tom was just saying, how is China seeing the threat to itself what are the dynamics internally within the country that we can look at on these issues on climate security and, and move forward um, 
uh, uh, to to address address the issue. I mean, it's it's complicated, and I don't want to oversimplify, but I think we need to be a bit more rigorous in the analysis. I think and understanding where China's coming from on climate. James, anything from you on this? James Rogers. Ah, yes, yeah, sorry. I, I'm afraid my computer froze while you were asking the question. So could you just repeat it, perhaps? It, it, it's about whether that, that people, whether we are addressing perhaps what a younger dynamic, and Sophia touched on this, but a younger group of uh, citizens are thinking, which is that, that everything is competitive. Everything in business and in uh, international relations and how we posture our defense forces um, and actually, this is about a global crisis, and it requires a degree of, uh, of new thinking and new opportunities, which uh, the current cohort of world leaders, they will say, don't seem to grasp. And I just wonder whether there's a language that we could be using that could, can, can I identify that uh, better. That was, I think that was a, the gist of the question that we, I read out. Sure. That's a very good question. I mean, I, I, I mean, it's a nice, a nice idea to imagine that we can come together to cooperate, and it, you know, we all see the world in the same ways. But unfortunately, um, as we've seen recently in the last, you know, five to ten years, some countries um, have, or some governments of some other countries have different agendas, and they're pushing back quite hard against um, our vision and the vision of other free and open uh, countries. But one thing that perhaps is a silver lining, you know, uh, at the end of every, at the edge of every cloud, is that actually, if you look at the past situations where there have been, you know, really big breakthroughs, um, actually, you do need a degree of competition that focuses people's minds um, and allows them to to generate the resources, the political will, um, and even to cooperate with others. Maybe not everyone, but certainly with um, a number of other countries, um, other organisations, and other groups to actually realise. Uh, a common uh, ambition. So if it is the case that we are confronting um, a climate crisis, which I think uh, we are, and not just a climate crisis, but we also see other forms of environmental degradation, whether that's the release of plastic waste into the ocean at an alarming scale with unforeseen consequences, then we do actually need to think of this a little bit as if we are at war, uh, in the sense that we need to do undertake radical actions in order to 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 secure uh, and or to achieve a final result. That that final result being something like I, I elaborated uh, earlier. So I don't think we should necessarily be afraid of competition. In fact, we should use it to 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 move towards a common success. And in that sense, it, it's not necessarily a a, a bad thing. Thank you. Sophia, that touched on what you said. Anything you'd like to come back on there? Well, look, I, I agree with the other panelists that competition can be a good thing. I think China did have a degree of, I mean, you, we always have to remember China's compact, the CCP's compact with its citizens is, is based around a compact of economic growth. And uh, China was quite canny uh, early on, I think it, it, it actually sort of um, sped ahead from a lot of Western governments in recognizing that there was an economic advantage to building adaption and, and resilience into your economic model um, towards climate change. And uh, But I, I would say that um, China is very aware that engagement on climate change is one of the few points of diplomatic leverage that it actually is retaining moving forward. And I do think that has been weighing into some of the backsliding that we've been seeing. I think they're gonna play hardball on this bin and, and you know, any kinds of commitments that might be uh, you know, eked out over around COP26, I think we have to accept that you know they're they're not going to be um, you know bound in stone and and I think you know the the CCP will continue to try and use this as leverage because they know that this is one of the few areas where we're saying um, you know you're you're not even necessarily a competitor you're you're a partner and a collaborator we've heard that language in the integrated review uh, we heard that language from Tony Blinken last week um, so I think they're watching all of this very closely. And uh, we have to accept that they will be trying to eke out as much power and leverage from that, um, that point as they can uh, over the coming months and years. Okay, so I've got another question here. Um, perhaps we could start with James on this and others might want to come in. 
are countries with larger militaries and more historic responsibility for climate change ready to respond to the threats that come along with or will be exacerbated by climate change, such as extremism, human and drug trafficking, uh, and displaced people? How prepared is Europe for the comparatively large, much larger refugee crisis that will likely to be occurring in, um, in the MENA region uh, in a warmer world? Now, James, you just come back from Sahel. You've been thinking about this. Uh, uh, we, a large part of your constituents' taxes go towards uh, policing, assisting with the policing of the Mediterranean. Uh, this is a problem that is coming to our shores now here uh, as we speak in the, in the channel. So. What element of climate change do you think that you know, is exacerbating this and what, what can we be doing to address this threat? Well, what I think, the, think, yeah, thanks, Richard. I, I think that the, the countries with the largest militaries and the biggest defense budgets are already doing most of the heavy lifting in the parts of the world that are most affected by, um, by desertification, certainly, if you sort of look around that belt of the planet and see who's there. Um, I mean, the Sahel is a monumental effort by the French with you know, support from many other nations, but extraordinary. And you know, America's commitment in um, similar places around the world is, is huge. We have a growing role both in the Sahel and in East Africa and have had a role alongside the Americans in, in the Middle East for, for some time. Uh, emerging powers, um, not really emerging powers, but China and India are also very big contributors to UN peacekeeping missions uh, as well. So, so I think that I think that those economies that you would think of as having the responsibility to be involved in the security solution to these challenges are already heavily involved. Now, are we ready for the growth in that uh, requirement? Yes. Um, I frantically start to remember what was in the IR paper yesterday versus what's in the Defence Command paper on Monday. Um, but I, but we are going to gear our force uh, around an understanding that we can't do it all ourselves. Neither can the French, neither can the Americans, neither even can the Chinese or the Indians or anybody else. And that actually uh, there is an enormous job of work to work with the countries in the regions where the challenge of climate change is most acute to develop their capacity to deal with these security challenges themselves. And that's a big theme, not only of our own uh, defense policy, but if you look at the interim foreign policy that the Biden administration put out, there's a reality, you know, there's an acceptance there that I think the line is that our armed forces can no longer be our first resort. Um, and, and, and I think that that demonstrates an agreement between the US, the UK, I think France, Germany and others are there as well, that actually um, we're already doing lots of the heavy lifting, but the real secret to dealing with this is through um, working alongside part to cut part the countries in those regions to develop capacity so that they can provide the security themselves. Tom, have you got a thought on this? I think James covered it very ably. I mean, I, the, the, the reality is that, you know, we, we need to work with everybody. And yes, we do have a particular responsibility. We were some of the first to industrialize. Uh, and therefore, we do have a particular responsibility, but it's it's one that now we share and, uh, you know, building good governance in places like Mali is uh, just as important to uh, tackling climate change. Because if we're going to have the so-called green wall of trees that you, you've you been particularly active in supporting, Richard, in various different ways and, you know, reversing desertification and things like that, it's all about building up stable communities and reducing migration. The reality is that, uh, I was speaking to the head of the WFP uh, this afternoon. You know, if you think that 5 million people from Syria was a lot, wait until you see what 500 million people from the Sahel looks like. Um, so there's a, there's a real challenge here that if we, you know, another reason, if you, if, you, if you like, why this is absolutely clearly, definitely, and without any shadow of a doubt in our immediate national interest. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, I've just used it, shamelessly used the chair at the moment now to bend your ear about what's going on in the Indian Ocean, where I'm involved with the ocean's issues and overfishing and various things, and that people think that's a niche issue. But a, a small, very vulnerable uh, group of island states like the Maldives has, as a percentage of its population, the highest number of returning jihadist combatants from Syria. Uh, 
it is being horrendously overfished, not least by the European Union uh, in the seas around there, uh, impoverishing this, this state from which uh, instability is only a heartbeat away. And it's not just there, it's all over the Indian Ocean. We have to understand this, and don't we, in terms of the geopolitics, in terms of uh, what I talked about earlier, the, the, the risk escalator effect of climate change and the malign impact of human beings on our environment, whether it's overfishing or, 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 or emitting. And uh, I, I just, in the dying few minutes, I would really like to uh, see, first of all, whether Erin would like to comment from a United States perspective. Do you think the new administration really get this? Because th this is not about an environmental catastrophe. It's about a geopolitical one. It's about security. And that incredibly important nexus is what we're all here tonight to discuss. Sure, thanks, Richard. I, I do think they get it. I think that you know putting John Kerry on the National Security Council sends a signal that this is part of every uh, security conversation. I do think they will continue to need pressure and resources from Congress as well to make sure that it's like, like as we've been talking about, well integrated over the long term, that it becomes part of the bureaucratic work that the national security community does to consider these climate issues. Because um, it's too easy to get distracted by this thing over there or that over there um, and, and not come back to it. Because it, it requires a new conception, as we've discussed, of what national security is. Um, but I think they're committed and I think they're working really hard um, to, to put these things in place we'll just see where it goes uh here thank you look i, I realize i've been a really crap chair but i haven't been keeping an eye on the clock I, I want to give you all 30 seconds just to to wrap things up um and we'll go in the same order that we started uh and then i'll uh, i'll just say a few words of thanks at the end um thank you uh, thank you james over to you oh no thanks richard thanks sen very interesting discussion uh i i'm i'm sorry uh, that there are some peaceniks in the chat room who I suspect will not be uh, reassured by what they've heard. But on the, uh, if the exam question was, what are the security threats that arise from climate change? They are myriad and severe. Uh, and the Ministry of Defence recognises that much of what we do over the next few decades will be driven in part or in whole by the effects of climate change. And we're gearing ourselves to be ready. Thank you. Tom. Look, I have to say I found uh, several things very interesting, particularly the, the surveys uh, that uh, Soph was talking about. And um, I found uh, Aaron's perspective absolutely fascinating. Look, I think this is this is a subject that's going to grow. I'm very glad that the Conservative Environment Network is doing these events. Um, I look forward to attending as a, as a listener rather than a, as a participant in the future, because there's an awful lot that I still need to learn on this. Thank you, Erin. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. It's been a great conversation and hearing uh, your perspectives. I would just say, as we discussed throughout today, you know, the collaboration amongst allies and partners and sharing of best practices is so important. And that's something we at the International Military Council on Climate and Security really try and do is we can all learn from each other about how to address these challenges going forward. So please encourage folks to stay in touch um, and we can we can work together on this. Thank you so much, uh, James. Yes, thank you very much for, for inviting me. It's been a very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, I would say uh, just four things, really. Uh, we need to do more. We need more resources, probably a lot more resources. Uh, we need to be more creative, both in terms of how we do it nationally, but also co collaborating internationally. And we in the UK um, need to lead. Thank you. Very succinct and absolutely agree. S uh, Sophia. Yes, thanks so much for having me. I think just to reiterate, I think the next decade is when both the risks and the painful transitions on climate change are going to emerge. We've just come out of a very um, unstable period in our politics, in part driven by people feeling they don't have necessarily a, a sufficient stake in our democratic and economic future. So let's um, absolutely keep pushing ahead with this integration of domestic and the international policy. I think it's really smart. Um, and I also would say that I think the integration within our foreign policy, the integration in the FCDO, we may see trade uh, joining there in the future, all of this helps us to see this in a holistic way. Um, we haven't talked about girls' education, another big um, issue for the government on the government's agenda. But again, this so plays into the heart of this. So um, yes, I think integration, integration, integration. 
Thank you. Um, thank you to all our speakers. That's been absolutely wonderful. And to all of you uh, who've dialed in, uh, I'll just finish by saying this, that when I uh, first got involved with SEN, it was a bit niche in the uh, parliamentary party. Uh, and there are a few of us uh, who will remember that, but it's suddenly become this absolutely uh, buzzing caucus. And that's not least to Meg, who sadly we're losing, and Jack and others um, who've been fantastic and have arranged this tonight. So thank you to Meg. Good luck where you're going um, in government. And, um, uh, and uh, please spread the word across the parliamentary party. I certainly do it at my end of the building. Uh, of the importance of Senate. And this is a way of really bringing a lot of interest that uh, exists in the center right of British politics around security, about defense, about uh, how we uh, keep our citizens safe in a dangerous world um, with an issue that our, your constituents really mind about, our fellow citizens really mind about. And so uh, let's not stop talking about this nexus of, of defense and security, climate change, uh, and uh, in the particular, in this vital year with the G7 coming up in June uh, in Cornwall, and then of course, Glasgow later in the year. So thank you for joining us. Sorry, we haven't been able to get all your questions in your comments in the chat room. I've been reading them and there's some brilliant other questions there. Uh, and Sen is the place to keep pumping them. Thank you all. Good night.